Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today on the show, we're joined by Zach Bradford, CEO of CleanSpark. CleanSpark is a publicly listed miner using its treasury model to scoop up distressed assets. We talk about treasury management, buying discounted contracts, and energy rates. Zach, welcome to the Mining Podcast. Great to have you on. Been a little bit. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's great. It's great. Yeah. The reason for this conversation, like I was just saying a second ago, is you guys have just been crushing it. Everyone else is really struggling out there. We see different projections from all these public mining companies trying to tell investors that, you know, we might not get that Bitcoin mine online by end of year. But you guys are out there buying up distressed assets, adding more extra hashes to your current hash rate under management. It's been really impressive to watch. Uh, I think a lot of people out there have been wanting to have your success story. So we're, we've come to you to learn a little bit of the secrets. Maybe we can rub the, the magic lamp and get some some takes from you. Um, but let's start off with some clean spark information, just to get like the 30 second elevator pitch on what you guys do for those who aren't familiar with clean spark. Awesome. Yeah. Happy to jump in I, I, and appreciate uh, the, the kind words. We've been working hard and it, it has been working out, not, not without a whole lot of effort. So clean spark, we are publicly traded, as you mentioned. Um, we're on the NASDAQ. You can find lots of information on us. Uh, our ticker symbol is CLSK. Um, but we have been Bitcoin mining since late 2020. Um, you know, a little bit of a late entrant from some of the other players. But, you know, when when we got in, we've, we've gone all in. Um, we have, you know, now four sites that are, are wholly owned operated sites. We also do have a little bit of uh, capacity hosted. Um, with some of the providers out there. We set our sights on being a top five miner. I think right now we find ourselves, you know, floating around around number three, depending on the day, um, as far as Bitcoin produced, exahash actually online and hashing. So um, we've become very focused on strategy over ideology. Um, that is something that has been a big focus for us. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the early days, um, all the public miners were hodling and they were hodling because it looked good for their stock. And they could say, look at all this Bitcoin I have. And it, it always goes up. Um, we instead said, Hey, we need to plan for the bear market real time. And so as a result, we always sold, you know, 60, 70% of the Bitcoin we mined. And then we only kept, you know, 20 or 30%. And I think that's been part of the key to our success is being willing to be different, um, upfront. And, you know, it proved to, it, you know, paid off to where we have a healthy balance sheet. And now that we're in a bear market, you know, bear markets are the times to build. And then you can enjoy that best during the bull market. So we've acquired, you know, we, a bunch of at miners. We just acquired, you know, a property, a 86 megawatt facility last month. We're just about to close on... Um, another facility, it's already been disclosed is, you know, it was Mawson's uh, 80 megawatts expandable to 230. So we believe we're, you know, now's the time to grow. Um, asset values are at the buyer's market. Um, that's definitely not going to last long term for the Bitcoin space and just trying to take advantage of it and uh, stay the course. Yeah, I love the fact that you brought up the ideology point at the very beginning, because I've actually been harping on that a little bit in some private conversations. And then even on this podcast that a lot of people got caught up in that marketing gimmick right at the beginning of the bull market. Like we're going to hodl this Bitcoin. We're going to pump the asset. We're going to pump our stock price. Everyone's going to love us. We're going to get those nice tweets. Uh, those tweets that go viral about us not selling diamond hands. That probably wasn't the best strategy going into a bear market. It's probably better to take profits as you can. right? And we've seen that over the last summer, not to throw shade on anybody, but there's been a lot of big miners out there that you thought would have better treasury management and they have not. And now they're looking to debt markets. They're looking to equity markets, trying to shore up their balance sheets at the same time, expand while guys like yourselves have already got that, the cash on your balance sheets and are able to go buy up distressed assets. So we can delve into that in a, a little bit later. I do want to start off though with the headline you guys just put out the other day about meeting that four X a hash goal in online we're on target to hit that five exa hash goal by the end of the year. Tell me a little bit about that. Let's go through some of the acquisitions, both mining contracts you guys have purchased this year, and then also the facility contracts you guys have purchased this year. There's been a number of them, so I, I won't know them off the top of my head. I'll leave it to you. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when when the bear market turn started, let, let's call it May, right? That's when kind of really things started, you know, going the opposite direction. Um, we very quickly took over a contract for the new Bitmain S19 XPs um, at substantially discounted prices. So um, it actually comes out to about uh, $29 per exahash is what we ended up being able to acquire those for. And we didn't have to put capital out for a long period of time. So that was really our first step. We then acquired some, you know, already hosted M30Ss. We have since purchased another 10,000 S19s. And then in the middle, we we picked up a few small batches of um, S19 J Pros throughout the process. Um, but really, you know, in the middle of it, the, the big move we did is we acquired a facility in Washington, Georgia, 36 megawatts now, or yeah, 36 megawatts now with another 50 that we're building out on top of it. And that's what got us from, you know, where we were to where we are today is, you know, we've been expanding. So maybe I'll step back. We, with the sites we have, we have one in College Park, 50 megawatts. It's been fully built out now since uh, about, about this time last year. Um, we acquired another one in Norcross. That was our 20 megawatts all immersion. And we basically been adding megawatts, you know, slowly and surely. Um, and all those megawatts will be fully online by the end of next month. But we do have the majority of them online now. So that facility plus the, the facility we just acquired in Washington that we filled all the way up. It did take us about 30 days to fill up all the rack space and get everything hashing and plugged in. But, you know, in... In June, I you know I, I think we were just under three x a hash, all the way to four x a hash in a pretty short period of time, um, with you know about one x a hash all in in just the last forty five days. So it's it's we've been real busy over here to say the least, and uh, just look forward to it continuing. Um, with that, the pointing kind of past four, us being on track for five, you know our guidance is just a little over five. We. We hope from a strategic point of view to always under promise and over deliver. So, you know, I think that's one thing that does set us apart to one rather than pointing to numbers that we couldn't reach. We have always pointed to numbers that we're going to go get. Um, same thing with not being ideological about holding the Bitcoin. Um, but when we do close on the Moss and site, we're going to be bringing online a bunch of exahash pretty much right away. I think it's, it's right around five or six hundred petahash out of the gate. But there's still some empty shelf space that we're going to fill up with those 10,000 units that we just ordered. So we really should be at five pretty quickly. And hopefully we can exceed that before the year end comes. But we'd rather under promise, hopefully over deliver on that. Awesome. Okay. There's three things I want to pull on from, from this point is the mining contracts, what you guys are purchasing and why. And when you go into the facilities and then the last bit talking about that guidance and how it relays into stock price expectations, given that the whole macro world has gone to hell pretty quickly. Uh, the, the first point, the XPs you bought, you bought some M30s, you bought some just standard S19s. When you guys are looking at these purchases for hash rate during a bear market, are you making too big of a fuss over what's more efficient than an, another machine? Or are you really just looking for the best deal? Or is there some other consideration when you're looking at these, these contracts? Yeah, we we do aim to buy the most efficient miners from like a generation perspective. Um, as long as it's latest generation from the manufacturer, we're we're pretty much you know feel okay about it. Every time we kind of pass a quarter, though, um, part of our strategy is to cycle machines long term. So you know, you buy a machine, it's got a five year life. Let's say an S nineteen. Um, the goal is with those S19s. And this was the same thing that happened when people bought S17s. They ran them for the entire life. They made a great ROI. And then because there is a robust secondary market, you sell it into the used market at some point. You got you got to try and time the markets. And then optimally you get, you know, 50 cents on the dollar. Or if you bought it in a bear market, hopefully you're getting all your money back. And then you buy a new one. So that is part of our strategy. So it's, it's about the deal being right. So we do want to have latest generation uh, from the manufacturer. We do want to buy, you know, efficient machines. We don't buy anything that's prior generation or, or too old. Um, optimally going into next year, it's mostly going to be, you know, XPs, M50s, things like that. 
But right now, the ROI from a dollars to return on investment is still better on an S19J Pro than it is on an XP. It's just the reality of the situation, unless you can find these really good deals kind of hidden out there. So our focus is on how long do we think it's going to take based on our projections to get our money back for the miner. And our goal is to try and buy miners with like a one year payback, depending on the power price and the facility where we're going to go put it. So it's a full equation that we look at when we when we make a purchasing decision. That'll be very helpful for a lot of people out there looking at miners right now. I think it might be slightly more confusing than the bull market. Bull market, you're just kind of like throwing cash at a wall, hoping, yeah. hoping everything goes up and normally <laughs> does. Uh, on a facility level, curious about the deal brokerage here. Mossums, obviously one. I think you had one other facility you mentioned. How do you guys come across these deals? Are you working with energy brokers? In this case, it seems like you worked with directly with Mossum or had previous relationships. Uh, any thoughts on like how these contracts come about for purchasing distressed assets? Yeah, we, we've actually always stayed pretty much working in-house. Um, we, we feel like we understand energy. We understand these facilities. Um, I hate to say it, brokers sometimes get in the way, right? Because, you know, for them, they, they, if they're getting a percentage, they want to maximize the, the total value. So the good thing is, is it's a fairly small industry. There's lots of good referrals, you know, for some of them, we've actually taken inbound calls, um, which is what happened with the last deal with Moss. And it was a friendly introduction through a banker that we shared. Um, but we really do do our own deal work. We do our diligence. We handle it all in house. We've got a great team that, that does all of that. Um, but a key part for us is I think that a lot can be, you know, these bear markets, there are temporary aspects to some of them. You know, for example, power agreements need to be renegotiated or redone. We understand how to do that. So we can step in um, to certain situations where we know how to fix a pre-existing problem. And I think that's what's created the opportunities for us is finding really, really good assets. You know, the the infrastructure needs to be good. Like Mawson built, for example, built a great site. Um, they have a great team. Um, but there's aspects that we look at and we're like, we can turn a screw here, we can turn a screw there, and then we can make the make it even better than it already was. And And so we always look at it that way. I think in this space, a lot of people need kind of the perfect inbox already to walk in. And I, I think that's given us a little bit of an advantage with our energy background. Interesting. Yeah. I think a lot of people right now are looking at distressed assets and wondering what to purchase, but you know, it's really hard to know because you might be buying someone else's trash and mm -hmm. you don't know until you know. Right. So it seems to be from what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's just a lot of in-house knowledge to be able to make those decisions. Yeah. And we've, you know, absolutely. And we've said no to a lot more deals than we've said, said yes to. So as much as we've had kind of two successes in quick succession, um, there is a whole lot of stuff that obviously never sees the light of day because it's just a bad fit for a variety of reasons. And I think that's the other thing too, if you're going to be a buyer in a bear market is you have to be, you know, you can't be drawn into saying yes, because something can look like a really good deal. And then just like you said, you don't want to buy someone else's trash. So, um, you know, we, we're, we're probably one out of every 20 that we look at right now. And, and I think that that's, you know, it, that, that's the part that doesn't get seen. That's all the hard work. It's just as hard to say no to certain things than it is to say yes. Gotcha. Yeah. It, that seems pretty fair. I think it's, it's yeah. hard to say disciplined <laughs> at some point. Okay. Quick comment on stock correlations right now from you, if I can, uh, Wondering how you think about guidance for Exahash, putting miners online in stock valuations. And I bring up this subject because there was a lot of people out there who during the bull market kept projecting larger Exahash online, right? And then they'd see that go up in their stock price and that helps everyone out. You know, it feels good to have a higher stock price at the end of the day. But you guys seem pretty responsible, right? Like the guidance was never crazy. It was whatever was feasible. And you guys are now hitting that. And a lot of other people have downgraded and have had some pretty tough calls with their stockholders. Curious if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, maybe even just like some thoughts on like where generally equities are for mining stocks right now. Like if you look at them on Y charts or Yahoo, it's like it's they're all in the gutter. But 
they're still there and it could be a good time to pick up some of these stocks. Yeah. You know, um, the correlations are a mess. I will, I'll say that. Um, and I think it comes in a few ways. Um, one of the issues that the space has is all of us are very heavily algorithmic traded. So there's, there's computers doing a lot of the trading. And so the problem you get is you'll see stocks go up and down based on what Bitcoin's doing, even if Bitcoin is trading in a band. So let, let's, let's take a look at the last month, for example. You know, Bitcoin's been trading in a band, very volatile, of course, but kind of bouncing around. And when, you know, you see, a, you know, a, a candle that's red on a chart for Bitcoin, it seems to impact the minor stocks in a bigger way. And I think that the, the, just by default, every time that there's maybe some, you know, f the, the fear index on a risk side goes down on Bitcoin, it, it's kind of the double effect hits the stocks. Now, at the same time, what you, you know, theoretically, um, our hope is, and, you know, a lot of analysts or chartists would say this is, well, if we run into a bull market again on Bitcoin, you should see the same thing. You know, the, the gains outpace the, you know, getting beat up. But unfortunately, we're in a bear market, so we're getting beat up in the other way. I think that from, um, and I can't comment, of course, directly on, on our stock. So I'm going to, everything is just broadly, broad in industry. Um, you know, from, from my point of view, I think if investors are paying attention to the companies that are actually being builders right now, I think that's what matters. Um, I don't think that, I, I think that some of the miners that are getting, you know, the higher valuations, they don't deserve it. And then there's companies that have lower valuations. And I'm not just speaking about us. I'm speaking about a, a group. Um, they, they deserve more. I think what happened, in my opinion, is everybody kind of got locked into a band when the bear market started. Let's call it May. So kind of like wherever you were at in the stack at that time, you haven't really broken out. You've just kind of traded algorithmically based on what happened with Bitcoin and everybody's chart looks the same generally, right? From a shape. If you zoom out on a month by month basis and everybody's been stuck, it's proven to be pretty difficult. You know, we've look how much we've grown, but look how little, you know, credit we've gotten for it. And there's others that have, you know, are in similar boats. I think the other thing too is, from a balance sheet point of view, our, our expectation is that um, groups that own their infrastructure, that truly control their destiny, should you know do better. Um, the asset light, with you know, has proven to be a very dangerous place to be. With you know what's happened with Compute North, for example, right? Um, there's a lot of miners. Not, there's not one. There's not two. There's a dozen that have exposure to Compute North. We are not one of those, but you know, that creates a problem. So anybody that has any hosting exposure always carries some risk of the host. And so, you know, we've always maintained the position. We always want to own the majority of our assets. That way there's, we at least control, we understand the destiny of what's happening in that situation and bad decisions of a third party can't necessarily bite us later. So I think all of those things, it's all going to come out in the wash, but you know, um, you know, we, we our, our feeling is, is we're, we just have to ride out the bear market. No one gets the attention they deserve in a bear market. And it's about coming, you know, who comes out looking the best on the back end. Yeah. Interesting points you're bringing up there. The fact that you guys have doubled or, or so your exit hash online over the summer. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there, but generally speaking, yeah. you know, yeah, generally speaking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you guys own your infrastructure and yet stock markets, don't seem to respond to it. And this is a conversation I've had with a lot of miners. Like, I yeah. just don't know if people who are buying these things really know what they're talking about, which doesn't yeah. give me and, a lot and, of confidence in the market. Look, but. Yeah, and you have to look at leverage too, right? Um, yeah. You know, wh which miners have more assets than market cap? There's there's a handful of us, yeah. right? Um, and that, of course, points to at least some sort of discrepancy that you know, everybody should do their own research and evaluate it themselves. But I think that there's some really key indicators. Um, and again, we, we our, our goal is to keep our heads down. We're going to do the work. We're, you know, I'm, I'm a big shareholder. All of our employees are shareholders. We all want the stock to go up. But our job is to keep our heads down and do the work. And, and, and you know, if we take 
a long-term mindset. It's not about what the stock's doing today, tomorrow, or even in a quarter or in two quarters. Optimally, it's where we stand in 2024. What happens when halving occurs, right? Did we prepare for halving? And that's how we're, we're really viewing it. You know, we're, we're, we're doing our 2023 and 2024 planning right now as much as we're executing our opportunities that are happening in this year. Another great segue. Let's talk about energy rates uh, going into the happening. A lot of people are expecting this event to basically kneecap high energy miners out there. So I'm curious for the acquisitions, the purchases, the extra hash you've already had online. How are you guys thinking about your energy costs? For example, maybe this Georgia facility you guys just purchased from Mawson might be a good example. What's the energy rate if you're able to disclose that? Uh, and then if I could get a little info about how you guys are thinking about clean energy going into this as well, given that might be more expensive, might be less expensive, but directionally, you guys always seem to want to have clean energy in your back pocket. Yeah, no, we we are over 90% carbon free once you include the energy credits. Um, we're actually carbon negative as a whole. Um, we don't broadly advertise that because the energy credits we think are imperfect. So we do focus on the source of power. We do talk about it being carbon free because there's a big debate about is nuclear, you know, clean, green, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't emit carbon. We think it's important. We also think it's important for the energy transition if we're ever going to be able to plug in all the electric vehicles we're going to have in 15 years, right? You need the base load to be there. And I think miners can be a big part of that. So we, all of our facilities in Georgia um, incorporate the majority of their power is coming from nuclear power, usually 70% or more, with the highest is over 95%. Um, a big focus for us is also being in communities that are have you know a transition plan in their in as part of their their process and what they're doing for their future purchases. For example, one of our communities we operate in, they had a plan to shut down the last of their coal plants, which was only like four percent of all their power. And we actually just found out they're closing a year ahead of schedule, partially because of the purchasing power that we bring to the table. So we do drive forward our strategy with that in mind first and foremost. Part of it's because we can, you know, it's a, when we're seeing this real time. As an industry, we can make a choice. We can either self-govern or be governed. And we want to self-govern so that when the governance comes and it looks like it you know, is coming around energy, that we're in a position where we can't be knocked off the horse and we can just stay the path. So that's our energy strategy first and foremost. Second is low cost power, right? We are operating in communities that do provide that opportunity in Georgia. I think we've got one of the best power agreements in the country in College Park. We, you know, that number is public. It's fixed price, 2.85 cents. Um, great relationship with the city. And that's, you know, 50 megawatts of good solid power at very low cost. Um, Moving into other facilities, we do have facilities that are exposed to market rate fluctuations. What we do for that is we do power management. You know, it's you basically curtail, but we are looking at long term forecasts. Um, so we are very and that's part of our strategic plan. Um, I won't go into all the details, but essentially we are looking at basically average cost over long periods of time and the opportunities to buy into um, basically power strips where you can hedge your power, things like that. So we actually feel comfortable being exposed in certain areas to market rates as long as there's a plan behind it, right? A curtailment plan, a long-term you know, plan at strategic times, uh, because right now is not the time to buy a long-term power strip, right? You, you end up buying into the wrong side of the market. But if you look at power curve and demand curves and how they look going into next year and beyond, there's some really good opportunities. So we're paying attention to the opportunities. Again, that comes down to where we not only feel that you have to understand Bitcoin, but you have to understand power and how power works all the way up to the utility level to make the right choices from a long term perspective. So we agree with you. We do think that there's a real risk for some miners to be, you know, kneecapped, as you put it, for, um, on a power basis. But we think that can all be managed. And we also think that it, it, as long as you're paying attention, there's good strategies, even for most miners out there that they can engage in. Um, you can't fix your geographic location, though. 
So you, as long as you get the geographic location right to begin with, there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate your power risk long term. Gotcha. Okay, as we got a little bit of time left, I'm going to ask two more questions, sort of going back to the beginning of the conversation. And it's just about the assets you guys have purchased to date. That takes one, a lot of discipline and two, some foresight to make decisions like this. And I want to know about your treasury strategy and then your operational strategy moving into these decisions. So for treasury strategy, first question is, how did you guys come about the strategy of selling your Bitcoin? And then how did you know when to sit and when to sell it to get these assets? And I'll ask the operations questions a second, but I didn't want to muddy the waters too much. Yeah, you know, I, the, my, the easiest answer, although, you know, maybe it's a broad answer and we can dig in a little bit, is we, we truly manage our Bitcoin day by day. So there are days where we sell more and days where we sell less. And because Bitcoin is so volatile and also because there's so many macroeconomic events going on in the world around us, as everybody knows, we our belief has been you can't ignore any of them. And so rather than try and guess the market by buying puts or calls, which is a strategy that at some point is, and we, we feel like the volatility has got to settle down that we'll probably engage in in the future. Historically, we haven't done any of that. Instead, we felt that really the best way to manage it is to say, hey, you know, on an interim hour basis, you know, now's, now we feel is a good time based on market signals. We'll sell a few here, we'll sell a few there. We've also taken days where, we say, hey, the data is all over the place. We're just going to average into it over the week, right? But it's very real time. We're, and again, that, that we, we, we've actually had these discussions a lot internally. It's, it's really nice to think you can just kind of set an algorithm and let it go. But we, we still think that there's, you know, there's something special about the human brain in taking 800 variables and saying, hey, let's, let's push it this way or that way. And as long as you're not saying, hey, we're selling the entire treasury today, then you can average into it. And the little nuances kind of, the, the, it, it all balances out, right? And our, our goal has always been, and I think we've managed to do this 11 out of the last you know 12 months, where our goal has always been, but by the, you know, wherever Bitcoin's at at the end of the month, we would like our average for what we sold it to be higher than wherever that sits. And, and it, we've, we've been pretty successful but without any complex strategy other than just real time watching Bitcoin a lot. Awesome. And so flipping those uh, sell events into asset purchases, have you guys done that directly where you take that cash that's sitting in your bank account and go and purchase S19s or do you guys use that cash to go make loans and then go purchase assets? Or how are you guys going about purchasing these assets you've uh, grabbed over the summer months. We we one strategic decision we did make is we did, we've never loaned against our Bitcoin. Um, we we felt like if we're gonna be real believers in Bitcoin too, we should use it as as currency, right? So we don't maintain large cash balances. We actually maintain our treasury. I'd say ninety five percent in Bitcoin, and when it comes time to an opportunity, we may liquidate that Bitcoin to go buy miners, right? We are a public company. It does mean we use equity. Um, we only use our equity to support capex so that can be miners that can be you know big purchases like this for new facilities um but you know when when we support our operations all of our operations are supported off our bitcoin so capex things because again we look at it this way if we if we use stock to grow the company well now the shareholders have more assets and and we're providing value Whereas operations, we believe it's our duty to our shareholders to be able to support ourselves off of revenues. And that comes in the form of Bitcoin. And what we also have looked at is, okay, our stock's down. That means it's more dilutive to use equity now than it was six months ago, right? Well, if you actually look at the ratio um, in how we've managed our equity, it's actually less dilutive because it would have taken, sure, the stock price was higher, but, you know, you had to go pay $100 uh, terahash for an S19 this time last year if you bought it, you know, in the open market without a, a contract in place. Whereas now you can buy the same thing, you know, in the low 20s and even the teens, uh, depending on the size, right? Um, obviously, when, when we're still placing big purchases, it's still in the, in the 20s right now. But if you look at the magnitude of separation, 
more often than not, as we've made these moves, it's been less dilutive, actually. Um, so that's how we've looked at our equity is, you know, if the things we're buying are worth less, then it's it's all the same. It comes out in the wash. We believe that, you know, from a lo- if, as long as we look long term, you know, everything is really growing quite a bit from a, where, where we think we're going to be able to put our, our valuation on a stock basis in the future. It's interesting. I hadn't thought about like the ra- the way the ratios with purchasing an equity and Terra hash uh, works out there. That's interesting. Okay, from an operations perspective, last question I'm going to throw to you. How did you guys handle picking up these facilities or picking up these miners? How did you guys put a plan in place in order to do that? What I've seen from Compass and from other miners is that you know, it's a lot of work to get boots on the ground, to get miners up on a shelf. And it's hard to keep staff on hand and then go deploy them when you need them for a little bit or to train staff into a facility. Oftentimes you sort of do it in scale, right? Like one step after another and hire as you need. Uh, But you guys have kind of leapfrogged that, right? You went from like uh, 2X a hash to 5X a hash or 4X a hash pretty quickly. So how do you guys handle it from an operational standpoint? Uh, We've been on a hiring spree, I'll tell you that. Um, And I I think it's, I I think we create a good environment where people want to work for us and that's led to high retention, which has been really good for us. But we also, if you really look at our capital structure, um, we, we pay above average wages, but still our power cost is, you know, 90% of what it costs to produce a Bitcoin compared to labor. Right? So when, when you start to put the ratios in place and you look at how you can improve uptime with a few extra hands, we actually run a 24, seven, 365 team. So, and we believe in having enough bandwidth for every single person that's there. So rather, so what, what we see sometimes and where I'm driving with that is some, some companies come in and they need a bunch of people to deploy. And then they're like, oh, we don't need as many. So they let people go. We actually kind of do it the opposite. We, you know, maybe a little bit understaffed at the beginning because every single person we hire to bring on, we want to still be there in two years. So we, you know, for example, the Washington site that we just picked up, um, there were, you know, four really good full-time employees that were there before we retained all of them when they came on, but we've now built the team to between 20 and 25 and it's the same facility, right? But now it's uptime is substantially better than what it was before. It all pays for itself. Right. And so I think that that's a key thing is one, you got to be a place people want to work. Um, two, you know, making sure people aren't stretched too thin definitely pays for itself long-term. And then, yeah, it, rather than try and, you know, plug a hole at the beginning and then be overstaffed, we, we're, we're fairly methodical about that process. Um, and, and it's helped us, you know, get things up and running in a good and organized way. But by the time it's up and running, there, we have no risk of, you know, keeping it running. Interesting. I love that perspective. Okay, actually, last question for you for real. Hash rate projection for the end of the year. I saw that we're like creeping towards 230. Do you have an end goal end of year where you think we're going to hit? Ooh, good. That, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends on, on a few factors. I would actually say that December 31st were 230 to 240. And, he, and here's why. I'll, I'll tell you why. One, I think we're going to see a few more distressed miners that maybe they have to shut down facilities. Um, maybe they don't. But the way that the power curves look, I think that miners that are exposed to market rates that don't have a good plan around it, they're going to be shutting down because of natural gas prices, because, you know, winter, everybody turns their heater on. So at the end of the year, I actually think that we'll see a, we'll see see a climb for the next 45, 60 days. I then think December, we'll see our first, you know, we'll see some decreases in percentage Um, and then I think we'll see it start to climb again late February. So I I think what we're going to see is a bit of a wave. So it's, uh, if you were to ask me, is it going up for this court, this next quarter, I'd say yes, from a hash rate perspective, but I think end of year, we're going to see a little bit of a dip. So I think my my miners ready to weather the storm, have a good power plan and stay plugged in. I think we'll get a little reward, hopefully, um, a little holiday bonus, but, uh, you know, as part of that, I, I think it'll be good. Um, and then it'll climb back up, you know, I, I, power curves look really good, you know, for the country, I'll say from a a cost point of view, 
you know, middle of next year and beyond. Um, so I think, I think the miners that survive until next spring are going to thrive for at least through halving and then halving is going to create its own set of challenges. Yeah. Uh, chaos is, awaits <laughs> there, huh? Yeah. You know, that's probably the best answer I've gotten to date. Uh, best analysis for exit hash by end of year. That's why they pay you the big bucks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Zach, thank you so much for joining us on the mining pod. Appreciate your time a lot. Thanks for joining. Hey, Will. Thanks a lot. Happy to be here. <laughs>